And welcome back to the Sybilla Creek Conversations podcast. My name is Wyatt Marchant here with my good friend, Mr. Paul Wilson. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Good. Yeah, I want to apologize out the gate. I am suffering from a somewhat of a cold. So yes. I'll be sniffling a lot. Hopefully that post-editing software edits that out. And your voice is like an octave lower. It's all good. Now you have that real kind of broadcasters. Yeah, kind of raspy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it wasn't too high to begin with. No, certainly not as high as mine. That's, I, sound, I was about to say that. I sound like Donald Duck, so, you know. No, no, no. You're always good. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Hopefully the audience saw me look at the camera right when I said that. <laughs> I always tell them on Sunday when they're adjusting the microphones, I'm always like, can you make me sound more like James Earl Jones, which, timely, we lost Mr. Jones this, I know. this week. So. I saw that honestly genuinely made me kind of sad. Yeah, he's been kind of... One of those voices that have been a part of much of my growing up. Some yeah. Some of those famous films that kind of came out in my air. Well, he's Darth Vader's voice. Yeah, Darth I Vader mean, and from Field of Dreams and a few other. On the bright side, you know, now with the AI, and this is bad to say post-death, but we won't, <laughs> we won't lose his voice. No. We won't lose his voice. So he'll live on in that way. Yeah, this has nothing to do with our podcast today, but very interesting uh, little factoid. Um, the latest Top Gun movie that came out, you know, um, one of the actors in that was in the original. And since then, he's had um, cancer that's basically taken away his capacity to speak. Mm. But he was in this most recent one. And what they did is through AI... They took his previous contributions in the previous episode, which was, what, 15, 20 years ago, and put words and sounds together to where he has a dialogue in this new one that's all AI-generated. I've, I've tried to use AI to make you say stuff you haven't said. Make me say. I stuff. have. I've tried to do this. Oh. Just, just like playing around. Like I was gonna post it. Anyway. Oh, okay. But I just wanted to see if I could do it. But the this this the catch is on the software that I use. There's other software that you can just do it. Okay. The software that I use, the person that you're trying, you have to ha like you would have to tell the software. It makes you say like, I I uh, my name is Paul Wilson and I allow for my voice to be used. And then oh. it matches because I have hour you know hundreds of hours of your voice right on my computer. And so I could easily make you say whatever, but I, but you would have to say before I did it, I'd have to, yeah, you essentially just give permission. I can make myself say whatever. Right. But yeah. And so one day I might try to just get you to read that so I can play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that anything I have to say is that important to, to replicate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it'd be funny. <laughs> funny for you. Paul's like, there's no way I'm giving him that power. <laughs> yeah, there's no way. I can pretty much assure you that. Oh, that's funny. But, all right. Well, on to the actual topic for today. We're answering our first um, audience uh, question that has been sent in, which, as a reminder, is a link in the description of the video and or the podcast that you can click and uh, send in a question or a topic that you want us to discuss. You can do that anonymously. Um, so take advantage of that, please, so that we have ideas. Um but the first, the question that we're answering today is our first one. And so here is the question. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Why originally would God have a chosen people? Why wouldn't he have made himself available to all people he created from the start? Wow. Interesting question. Mm. So let me begin with a disclaimer. Uh, you and I have never posited it ourselves as having everything figured out or that we're always correct. Yeah. We're basically just taking shots in the dark 20% yeah, pretty <laughs> much. of the time. Um, so I'm not, I'm not holding out today's explanation as the final answer or the final word on this topic. Yeah. This is my best understanding. I'm sure there's a bunch of experts that have addressed this question yeah. that oh, we sure. just haven't sure. read. Um, and the question's fair because I think there is a prevailing perception out there that um, God has a chosen people. They are his 
and the words often describe it, they're his favorite people and that doesn't seem fair to other people groups so there seems to be a certain injustice to it all mm. um so i'm gonna give you my best understanding of that mm -hmm. and what's helped me the most in my research and my exploration of this topic is that it's not really about God having a favorite people at all. In fact, it never was. It's really about that God chose an individual. So it was never about the Jews. It was never about a nation. It was about a person. God chose a man. His name was Abraham. Now, I don't know the rationale that God used for why he chose that particular individual. Yeah. Of those that existed on earth at the time, Abraham was just one. I don't know what the population of the world at the time was, but God chose a man named Abraham. Abraham wasn't a Jew. He, in fact, it, and in the strict use of the terms Jew and Gentile, Abraham would have been a Gentile. He, he wasn't, the, the whole understanding of Jews as a race, as a national identity didn't exist at the I time. I was going to say you couldn't even be a Jew. It no, didn't exist. It didn't exist. So in the strict use of the term Gentile, it just means like people of the lands. Um, he just chose a person. And like I said, I don't know why God chose Abraham from any number of other inhabitants of the earth. So I can't explain that to anybody. I don't think the scriptures describe that. So that would all be conjecture. Mm -hmm. But here, here's the deal. And again, my understanding of it. He chose an individual and two things happened. One, he made promises to that individual. And he stipulated a purpose for that individual. So, um, first of all, he makes a promise to this individual. And part of the promise is um, your descendants are going to multiply and they're going to become a great group, of, a, a great number of people. I, I don't know, again, this would be, I'd, I'd have to confirm this. I don't think he's saying to Abraham, hey, Abraham, your descendants are going to become a nation. I think he's saying your descendants are going to become an enormous group of people. Yeah. Okay. I don't think, I don't think nation is described in no. the, that, what would, that's called so the that's, Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. So Genesis chapter 12, he's saying yeah. this to Abraham. Your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky. And this is, this is the important part. I'm going to bless all the peoples of the world through this people that will become. I don't, I don't read that as, um, I I'm going to love these people more than anybody else. In fact, He's saying, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to do a work through you. And that work is I'm going to bless all the peoples of the world through you and the descendants that will come after you. And what's so unfortunate in my, again, my opinion, my perspective on this, what's so unfortunate is that rather than camp out on the blessing that would come through this choice that God made, it seems like most people are resentful that it was a group of people that didn't include them. The, the, the whole purpose was I'm going to bless people and it feels like all the other people outside of that, you know, that circle, they're resentful, jealous, covetous of the fact that God made that arrangement with somebody other than them. 
Does, it, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, what what happens in chosen people, and th- this is this is the game changer for me. What happens in this idea of a chosen people is, it's not about Israel, it's about God. It's not about that Israel is more special than anybody else or that Israel has favored status that nobody else possesses. It's more about the kind of God that God is. He is a promise keeper. He made a promise to a man named Abraham, and he's kept that promise for all these generations. He's never once backed away from the promise that he made. So. I really look at the chosen people uh, status that, um, you know, is such a common way of referring to the nation of Israel. Um, I see it as it's really a reflection more of God and his character than it is about Israel and their character. Mm. Did you follow that? Mm-hmm. When I, when I kind of got my arms around that mentally, that, that helped me a lot with the apparent injustice of God having a people. Um, especially if you keep in mind that the whole purpose for which God arranged for this nation to be um, used by him was to become a blessing to every other people on the planet. Mm-hmm. And, and so then you go, well, why did he choose a particular person and a particular group of people for which to accomplish this redemptive purpose of um, demonstrating what it's like to live in, a, in an allegiance and a relationship with God? I, I, again, this may be very unscientific. I'm simply saying he had to choose a group of people to do all that he was going to do through them as a way of um, giving it some sort of a concrete existence. Yeah. It's not like he could have just described that. He, He portrayed it. He embodied it in the real life experience of a group of people to whom he made a promise, um, as a way to illustrate for everybody else around them. This is what it's like to live in a relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I think people do kind of have a reactionary response, at least nowadays at, at the, the, uh, it being unjust. Yeah. Because it wasn't uh, totally inclusive of everyone, but it's like the same question could be asked. Well, why did Jesus only have 12 disciples? Why didn't he just have make everyone his disciple? Why didn't he make everyone? His... Yeah. yeah. So, in the same vein, he, he chooses 12 disciples because it gives them, it gives him a, um, a portrait. It gives him a, a, an incubator, gives him a, a, a context around which he can illustrate for generations to come what it's like to be a follower of Jesus. He could, yes, he could have described it, but Anytime you describe something, if you can portray it or illustrate it, it's always going to be that much more helpful and enduring as a lesson that a teacher's trying to present. Yeah. Well, and like those things actually had to happen. What's like, like from Abraham all the way to Jesus, like this was a, if you think about this as a narrative being written, because I mean, I think literally are not our lives are basically just stories and you know yeah. we're a care we're the main character of our own story sure cliched but like there's a story being written and you can't have yet you've never read a book or a narrative that has every character it has a character or a right. few characters and a main character that does something because right. you can't accomplish things you have to have someone have to doing have it character. in the same way that like jesus had like jesus had to actually do the work on the cross. It couldn't just be described. It actually had to be accomplished and someone had to do it. And then the the early church had to grow. Those 12 disciples, you know, could, they had to actually do the the work of the early church. Yeah. So with that, that 
what you just described, I would say I could go back to Abraham. Yeah. And I'd say God had a thing he wanted to accomplish exactly. in the lives of human beings. And he chose a character for the story. And he made a promise to that character. And here we are centuries later, and he's continuing to be faithful to them. Yeah. Well, and when I was preparing for this, when I was just preparing, when I was thinking about this today, I went actually to Noah first. Okay. Just because before then, like after Noah, you have God working within a smaller set of, of people. Right. Before that, it was kind of ambiguous as to who he was working with. Like you have Cain and Abel, then you have a few other ones, like like a track, people are in it. Right. But I mean, you have all these people filling up the earth. And then once you get to Noah, it says that, well, the earth has become so basically vile. So wicked. Yeah. So wicked. But Noah walked with God. He was a righteous man. So God chose, it tells us why he chose Noah. Yeah. But you're right. And then it doesn't really tell us why he chose Abraham. Abraham just kind of comes onto the scene. It doesn't even make sense from what we know about Abraham. It seems like he was just living in his parents' tent and he was like 80 years old. So he wasn't doing great, <laughs> you know, from all, <laughs> but, but God, but God did choose Noah. And before that, he didn't really have a set people. Right. And it didn't, now you could, you know, it didn't really turn out great, obviously. Yeah. He, he regretted even starting this entire enterprise. Right. So um, I think one of the important clarifications that needs to be made, and I'm seeing it a lot, particularly in a kind of contemporary upheaval around the nation of Israel. Um, and this is really hard to explain. The people of Israel that God um, works through in the Old Testament. You ready? Man, your eyebrow just went up. Careful. Like, oh, okay. You're going to upset a lot of people. I uh, know what you're about to say, I think. <laughs> The people of Israel that God was writing the story through yeah. in the Old Testament is not an immediate parallel to the nation and government of Israel that now exist in contemporary history. But they have the same name. Okay. They are of the same lineage, but they are not a theocracy as God intended the covenant to be accomplished through. So they have the contemporary identity of the nation of Israel as a governmental. As a nation state, yeah. As a nation state. That is not the immediate parallel to everything that you see unfolding in the Old Testament. I agree. Okay. So... For that reason, this, this is where it gets dicey. I don't think and I don't expect that the nation of Israel that exists today is without blame or without fault in some of what's happening in the geopolitical situation that's in the news. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think they're living under the design of God that was presented in the Abrahamic covenant of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They have wandered off from that. They have moved astray from that. And so I don't, I don't believe that they're living under a favored status of God because of what they're, how they exist today, other than his abiding promise to do a work through the Jews. Mm -hmm. and, and I think why that's important is, or, or the, the reason I feel like I can defend that biblically is if you look at the Old Testament and the story of Israel in the Old Testament, they weren't perfect then. Yeah. And they didn't always get it right then. They didn't always do right then. And that's why the Old Testament is a narrative of ups and downs as it relates to the prosperity of the nation of Israel. And so what you see is a group of people, the Jews, who at times 
disregard, disobey God and his design of the covenant with them, and they pay the price. Yeah. They are defeated in war and their financial or, uh, yeah, their financial economic prosperity suffers. Their social prosperity suffers. They get carried off into exile for multiple times and for, you know, generations, 70 years. Um, so we see illustration in the Old Testament of Israel getting it wrong and experiencing God's judgment, God's discipline on them. So it's not impossible in my mind to look at the contemporary expression of the nation state of Israel and imagine that they're living outside of the design. Mm -hmm. And especially, in, especially when you stop to look at the fact that God's design for the nation of Israel was all leading up to the presentation of their Messiah, yeah, Jesus, and they rejected that. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's not impossible for me to imagine that since the rejection of Jesus as the promised Messiah, that Israel has, has lived as a people and as a nation, they've lived in a less than ideal kind of situation that they could enjoy under the favor of God's promised blessing to them. Yeah. Did you follow that? Uh -huh. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's something that I always bring up <clears throat> when I'm talking to people about this is that they're really big on, and this goes so far outside of, I guess, the range of the question, but it kind of gets into the second question I've had, like, does God have the chosen people today? And, um, I was always bring that up. It's like, okay, well, the Jews have wholly, you know, um, not accepted Christ. And so as a Messiah, as a Messiah. And so, um, I, I don't know what role they play in a chosen people now, you know? Right. And, and in fact, I think that chosen people status has gone over to the church probably. Mm. I don't know. I think there's I, a cho I think there are, I think there's still promises right that are given to the Jews. But he's going to like Christ's entire appeal and especially towards the end of the age is that the church is going to be the bride of Christ, not the Jews. Right. I I see very separate programs. Yeah. A program a redemptive program that God's doing through that people the Jews that he promised through Abraham. I think there's a separate, re a distinct redemptive program that he's doing amongst Jews and Gentiles as the church. Um, there's some overlap. You can't read the book of Romans without seeing the overlap that Gentiles are invited or grafted into the plan of God and the purposes of God that he had originally designed for the nation of Israel, but I still see them very separate. There's another redemptive plan for the Jews outside of Christ? Um, no, it's just that, in my opinion, the plan that God was working in the nation of Israel was interrupted when they rejected Jesus as Messiah. Mm. So God starts a new one to to be the church when that redemptive plan for the church culminates with the rapture then my prophetic understanding is that god then picks up and continues what it was that he was seeking to accomplish mm. in in the nation of israel and on behalf of the nation of israel. yeah that he's going to fulfill all the promises literally through the events of the prophetic future. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm I'm ignorant on especially revelation in regards to some yeah. of this. I I see the language that you see in the Old Testament uh in the New Testament where the church is a mystery. I see that as you don't read any of that, you don't see any of that in the Old Testament. Yeah. Anything about the church. So it's a new man, as Ephesians 
describes the church. It's it's a new it's a new expression of what God's trying to do on behalf of human beings. The church is a new uh, Ephesians, a new man. Now Jews and Gentiles brought together under the saving work of Christ for the purpose of the gospel. Okay, so this your I guess your argument is kind of that it wasn't always the plan. No, I mean you have a sovereign God who knows all. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's things. very hard to yeah. But had Israel accepted Christ as Messiah, the story would be very different, mm -hmm. and they would continue to be what they were designed to be, and that was a blessing to all. Mm -hmm. That God's redemptive blessings would come through the nation of Israel as a people, and I don't think that's happening. I think God God allows that re, his larger redemptive purposes to continue through Christ, but not through the Jews. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, I was thinking about this on the way over here uh, in the car. Um, so is God still... Is God still protecting and providing for the Jews? I believe, yes, he is. Um, not in the way that it's described in the um, Abrahamic or Mosaic covenant of the Old Testament. I think that's changed because of Israel's posture toward God. But he made a promise to a man, and he's going to be faithful to that promise. And one of the ways that I believe he's faithful to that promise is that he continues to preserve and protect the Jews. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this. Um, when I was in graduate school, I went to Israel for a little over a month and studied at a university there. And the course I was taking, so it was kind of a, what do you call that? When you go away for abroad. Yeah, a study abroad. That's mm -hmm. what. It, so the course I was taking was a course in biblical geography. So um, our days were spent. There was some classroom learning, um, lectures from some outside uh, experts, and then the majority of each of the days we were spent going to various geographic uh, sites throughout the nation of Israel. Uh, you know, ruins and findings and, and all these things. Uh, because of the nature of the course, we spent a lot of time hiking ridges and looking down in, it's called wadis, you know, the places where rivers run between mountains. And, and it was all around the story of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Fascinating experience. But I remember one of the lecturers that came in, he wasn't, he wasn't on the faculty at the university I was attending. He was a lecturer, and I think he was a professor at like the Hebrew University, and he came to give a historical perspective to the current situation in Israel at the time. And it wasn't from a biblical redemptive explanation. It was strictly historic. And I remember he had this, he had this enormous map up on this easel and it was a map of sort of the Middle East. And um, it was, you know, kind of your typical yellows and browns because that's all arid country over there. And then the blue of, of whatever bodies of water. Very, just these two colors. And during the lecture, he's explaining wars and treaties and empires that came through the nation of Israel, uh, the land of the Middle East. And at one point he takes this like uh, plastic overlay and he puts it over the map and it just highlights the nation of Israel, which again, don't quote me, but it's, I think it's like a hundred miles long and about 30 some miles wide. And he, he puts this little red overlay on that. And he's telling us more and more. And then another point he takes this other overlay and it's, I remember correctly, it was green, and it represented all the Muslim countries of that region who were 
particularly aligned against the nation of Israel, who, who were specifically driven by the agenda of eliminating the nation of Israel as a place of inhabitation by the Jews. And I just remember this is the first time I'd ever seen it this way. That little red section of that map and then that enormous green section. And I, I remember thinking to myself, there's only one explanation for why that, that land and those Jews that live in it are even still there. Yeah. And that's supernatural, divine protection and preservation. Um, Israel, it has a, a very elaborate um, system around which it protects itself. It has a very accomplished military. It has a very passionate military. I mean, you know, everybody's required to serve in the military. And, and when you, I mean, you just read some of the history of Israel and you, you understand the enormous focus they have on their safety. Because it seems like everybody's, you know, attacking them all the time. And it's not just for, can I, can I get a little bit of real estate? It's, we want to wipe you out. Yeah. We want you to cease to exist. So then that creates this very intense sort of um, drive to protect and preserve themselves. So that they have all the most elaborate systems and very passionate, committed, disciplined military. But when you look at that map of comparison, you can't have that sophisticated of an army or a military and still defend yourself sufficiently against every other thing that's aligned against you other than a God who made a promise that he, that he's going to fulfill through that group of people. Now I know it's full of all sorts of geopolitical tension and people have different understandings and different perspectives and, I go back to saying, I don't believe that Israel is the nation of Israel as it currently exists as a government. I don't believe that it's perfect. It's faultless in the situation. Um, and I think there are very li uh, vivid and real uh, complaints about the situation dynamics of how it all works out. But the fact that that group of people in that land still exists the way that they do I think goes back to a God who made a promise mm. to preserve and protect those people. And um, so going back to the original question, I go, I, it's not about Israel. It's about God. Mm -hmm. It's not about them having favored status or being chosen to where they're loved more, favored more, they're protected more, they're, um, blessed more than any other group of people. I, I don't see it that way. I see it as the exceptional display of an amazing God who keeps promises. And mm -hmm. there's lessons from that. There's spiritual insights of that that apply to you and I as 21st century Christians. Mm -hmm. That the God who provided the Savior that we trust in faith um, that's the same God that made those promises to Israel. So promises that he's made to us as Christians, which I think are different promises, the promises that he's made to us as Christians, we understand a bit of his character and how he does at keeping promises. So we can find an enormous amount of assurance and reassurance knowing that the God who provided the salvation that I profess through my faith in Jesus Christ is a promise keeper mm -hmm. and I'm safe and I can look forward to eternity in heaven with him. And I can look forward to the complete and thorough forgiveness of my sin. That There's no longer condemnation for my sin because of the work of Jesus Christ on my behalf. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, I, I know listeners, other people, uh, may have a different perspective on that, but 
um, that's kind of where I land on on that discussion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot there that oh, we could. Yeah. Yeah. Like my immediate response is, we'll say the United States said, "You're on your own, buddy." I don't know if they'd still be there. It would seem impossible. Yeah. But that. I'm not saying that the Jews would be annihilated. I would just don't know if the nation state that currently exists. No. And I don't either. know. I don't know because I don't think that's what God's seeking to preserve the, the nation state. Exactly. Because it only really existed since what? 19 yeah. something? 40 something. So 48, I think. He, what he's preserving is the people who are the descendants of the man that he chose to do a work. Yeah. And how that's defined and how that's identified by DNA and, you know, and then there's the whole discussion of the spiritual Israel and the nature of their hearts versus their bloodline or, you know, national identity. Again, there's just so many nuances to it all. And trying, trying to interpret the contemporary situation and what's happening in the, you know, it's unfolding in the news um, and trying to drive in all of that Old Testament covenantal nuance. Um, that's what makes it so, such an explosive sort of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, would you say that we as Christ followers are now a chosen people? Uh, we're definitely chosen. Uh, First Peter tells us that. Yeah. Um, we function in many of the same ways that God intended the people of Israel to function. We are a priesthood. We are a chosen people. God wanted to do something through human beings as a mediator to the rest of the world. And at one time, he intended to do that through the people of Israel. Now he's intending to do that through the church that we become the church, Christians, um, we become the ambassadors of heaven to deliver a redemptive message to the world about a Messiah named Jesus. And the fruit of our relationship with the living God through that Messiah is that we can, we can experience a quality of life, a, a, a blessed life that could be a draw to the people around us. I mean, that's, that's what it should be. Unfortunately, too often Christians in the church, they don't, they don't always present that kind of a compelling ambassadorship. Sure. Just the, just the opposite. Well, that's the same true of the nation of Israel. God intended to demonstrate to the nations, this wonderful blessed life that, that you live in a relationship with God as your King. But then Israel squandered that and they pursued other gods and they wanted a king of, you know, an earthly king rather than God being the king. And God said, don't do that. That'll, that's not going to go well for you. But we want a king like all the other nations. And so God's relented. He said, okay, here's your king. And what happened? It, all the things that he said would happen, happened. And so Israel squandered this opportunity to um, embody and portray this amazing blessed life of living with God as your king. And it forfeited its witness. It forfeited its, um, I, I call it its redemptive purpose of drawing all men to, men and women, to God. Because Israel at times lived in such a way that the nations were like, what kind of God is that? What, what kind of life is that? We, well, the we, church does the same thing. Yeah. So just like Israel did it poorly, the church often does well, it poorly. They're both made up of people, so it's going to be... It's amazing. People with sinful hearts yeah. who don't always make the right choices. Yeah. Yeah, because if it's the exclusivity that the chosen people imply that bothers people, Christianity is, you know, among the most exclusive. Yeah. It accepts... The invitation goes out to everyone on, uh, however, you still have to, 
you, you still have to accept Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. Yeah. But other than that, it's exclusive. E, and like even, I would say, even the Jews at the end, no matter what they do, if they don't accept Christ as Lord, I feel like the scriptures make it clear that there's only one path. No matter what the Jews do from now, if they don't, if they don't, you know, relent in, in, in saying no to Christ, it's not going to matter. Because God's redemptive um, historical arc was to bring Israel to Jesus. Yeah. So he's still insisting on that. Um, well, I would say that Jesus came from Israel. Oh, he did. And he so I guess that's where, like, I, I guess my confusion of, like, the two separate redemptive arcs, like, Jesus is the culmination of the original redemptive arc, no? Yes. I guess I'm confused as to how there's, like, wasn't, wasn't what, he, what God trying to accomplish through Israel, through the Jews, Christ? Yes. But there's more? I know there's still promises for the people, but like a full-out rejection of his son at this culmination. If, if I'm understanding your question. The promises to Israel... Yes, we're all directed toward Jesus. Yeah. Like the, uh, the fulfillment of those promises. Um, when Israel rejects Jesus, this is the language I use. God put what he was doing in relationship to Israel, he put it on hold. And it will resume again after the rapture of the church. And here's what's going to happen is tribulation and the millennial kingdom and all those future prophetic events are basically going to bring Israel back to that understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. Whenever you say that Israel rejected Jesus, are you just saying that some or, or the majority of Jews rejected Jesus? Um, Its representatives rejected Jesus. Okay. So, like the teachers and yeah. leaders rejected Jesus. So, that's not to say that all Jews rejected Jesus because we know of at least 12 that, well, 11 that did. Yeah. And a lot more. And throughout. a lot more than yeah. 72, and then the 121, and then the 5,000. And, and really, we're well into the book of Acts, and primarily the converts of that time are Jews. Yeah. So till Paul gets going. Yeah, then you bring in Paul. <laughs> he wants to go start passing out pamphlets to all the Gentiles. <laughs> so again, I will be the first to say it's it's highly nuanced. It's got numerous dimensions. There's so many different facts and figures and calendars and and timelines and histories that you know kind of all converge that makes it a really complicated conversation to to navigate with a certain clarity without a million yeah buts and what ifs and and so yeah i get that um there's enough clarity in my head and i'm not saying that my head is the right i'm just saying the clarity in my head is that God made a promise to a man and he's continuing to be faithful to that promise. And that, that those descendants that he promised them would become a nation. We identify that nation as the people of Israel, the Jews. And God even admits how screwy that God, God was at work. God was doing something until with Israel to the point that they rejected the Messiah, Jesus. Then God opened up the door of opportunity for Gentiles to join Jews under a faith in the cross, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, to do the work that he had hoped to do amongst mankind through the body of Christ, the church. When that redemptive 
um, parentheses is finished, I think God's going to resume that work that he was intending to do in and through the Jews. He's going to accomplish that hmm. in the future. We should do a whole podcast on just that. That what? Like end time, what that's supposed to look like. That what is that called? Prophecy? Oh, es eschatology. Eschatology. Yeah. Yeah, there aren't any any differing viewpoints or perspectives. Yeah, that. none. <laughs> none. Yeah. Even on this question, like yeah. where does, like what, where what role does Israel play? I mean, there's tons of different viewpoints. And there's tons of different viewpoints about where's the church and what are they doing while God's continuing his work with Israel after the rapture. Yeah. And depending on how you read certain verses and translate certain Greek words, people have developed all different explanations for that. And yeah. That's where you get things like premillennial and postmillennial and amillennial and pre-trib and post-trib. And it's just, it's all the same stuff, just people drawing different conclusions about how you interpret a verse or two sometimes. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to, for us to tackle that. Again, sort of like this question, just knowing that I'm not saying got it all figured out and that I'm exactly right. Just saying, here's my best understanding of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, um, well, I, I don't have a good illustration top of my head i just have to i have to i feel like i have to plant my feet somewhere in order to operate from on some of these you know complex complicated nuanced discussions of the scripture i feel like i have to plant plant my feet somewhere as some sort of a foundation from which to operate and if somebody doesn't agree with it that's fine go ahead and choose the place where you're going to stand from and operate and we just may never ever you know agree on everything and, and again i think that's fine um so i i look at 62 now wyatt i'm looking at 62 years of teaching and education and experience, own personal studies, what, 40 years now of preaching most Sundays of my life, um, accumulating sort of a working knowledge of the scriptures and the rules that I use for in doing, doing that consistently and properly. And I've come to kind of a collective body of what I understand to be truth. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a, I'm not in any way insisting that I'm right. Yeah. I'm just saying this is the baseline I've chosen to operate from. Well, you believe you're right. Sure. Or you wouldn't believe the things you, but, but you're not saying I know better than everybody else. This no. is just what I believe to be right. Yeah. No, I think, I think humility is about having a confidence in who you are, how you are and what you are but in no way seeing yourself as better than yeah than person yeah well and the ability to change change your mind if given yeah. like i've changed my mind or just over the course of like doing this podcast it's forced me into like actually thinking about issues yeah. and other things that i've changed my mind on i'd like to think i've changed my mind over the years on a number of things yeah yeah but yeah no that's it's it's just very interesting, like, especially with all the eschatology stuff, like there's definitely, I was going to say originally, you know, most of it doesn't have a huge influence on necessarily what you would be preaching, not like being a preacher, but like what you would preach as a person. But then I was thinking, well, there's pe like, I've heard people out there that are like trying to get red heifers into Israel and like all this stuff. And I'm like, my gosh, I guess and like preparing for this stuff. And I'm like, this entire time, I just thought, well, if Christ comes back, I don't need to have beans in the pantry, you know? Right. And, and I, and I'm not incredibly worried about making sure that Israel has the third temple so that the red heifer can be killed along with the other ones. 
these things just don't come up in my head throughout my normal day, but I, it depends on how you see. Oh yeah. Your ask For whatever some, your, your eschatology is. For some people that's very, very real. I also think it's not on that. It's kind of silly that you can, that people think they can force Christ's return. Yeah. That's really silly. Cause it's like not even Christ himself knew when he was coming back. You think you can just make it happen? Yeah. That'd be possible. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I'm not an expert on any topic. In fact, I'm kind of like a generalist. I, I'm sort of like your uh, family doctor rather than the brain surgeon. Yeah, That's yeah, the specialist. Yeah, my personality and and even the level of my education. And so, um, there's a couple of topics I feel like I have a lot of dexterity with, theologically. Um, spiritual life i've just trafficked in that topic more than any because of the nature of my role as a pastor um there's a couple other topics that i i think i've i've got a i've got a really um thorough teachable point of view on it but i'm the first to admit man eschatology if we're if we're going to cover that i'm going to have to do a lot of study because I'm not very precise. I got sort of the big ticket items where I I think they fall out. But if you go ask me, you know, the horsemen and who they represent and and who the beast is and who the harlot is and who you know antichrist, I'm I'm not specific specific yeah. to that. Yeah, if we ever did that, it would just be more of a you presenting what you're general view of the end time is yeah so kind of an eschatological time just because i don't even like i've picked up pieces here and there but i don't think there's ever been like a i don't know a prolonged series on it so no i've never i've never done a prolonged series i've covered it i i used to do a class that's well called um top 10 we looked at the top 10 theological categories and so one of those i'd spend one of the sessions on eschatology and that's really all I cover is sort of a broad eschatological timeline of I think this will happen before this and then this follows that and and here's some chapters and verses why I, you know put these things where they are but if you if you want to nail me down on you know does this represent that country and this political leader and I'm going to tell you I I don't know I don't know anybody who does know there's a lot of people act like they know. Well, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, a lot of people that have been wrong many times over the years. Yeah, because you know, I started going to church when I was in the third grade, and you know, really biblically sound, theologically um, founded churches. Like I've really had a rich heritage of really good preaching and teaching, and then you know, you throw in Bible college and master's degree in theology and i can tell you ever since i was a kid every year somebody's been absolutely positive who the antichrist was mm -hmm. and it was this political leader from russia or this political leader from china or this political leader from you know some other region of the, the world. other side of the aisle yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> and the next thing you know a new year has gone and that person didn't do anything the antichrist was supposed to do and so now they're you know they're naming another one yeah or like the the mark of the beast and... yeah yeah and so that's that's a part of my uh my disinterest or my skepticism on being real dogmatic and specific yeah. about a lot of that stuff because i just find it very fruitless yeah it just works people up other than really helps or edifies them man people love that content oh they eat it up. You want to start something on Facebook, start talking about <laughs> pre-mail versus post-mail. I'll tell you what, you'll oh. get a lot of middle-aged people real riled up. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I've had, you know, we've been at Cibolo now for 28 years. I don't think there's ever been a year that didn't go by that somebody's, you know, turning the screws. Do a, a series on prophecy and talk about, you know, this, this, and that. And I'm just like, yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, uh, here's here's the top prophetic event that I think everyone should be most alert to now, and that's the rapture. Yeah. And it could happen at any moment, and you best be prepared when it happens. 
Well, I was going to say, I was like, I think that my, my, uh, the most important thing about going along with what you said, the most important piece of my eschatology is Jesus said he was coming back and he said he was coming back soon. So that's any time. It's been a while. And yeah, I, you know, everybody always talks about like, um, you know, we're getting really close to when Christ is coming back. And I'm like, <laughs> they've been saying that for 2000. Well, I agree with you in that we're getting closer as time has passed. Yeah. Every day's a little yeah. bit closer. Yeah. But I mean, there's the an earthquake point. in Haiti and everybody is like, it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. well, I don't know. I bet you people thought that during the bubonic plague too, right? Like three qu two qu two thirds of the world died and everybody was like, it has to be close. What's that? Uh, what's the city in Italy that got literally fricasseed by the volcano? Oh, um, Pompeii. Pompeii. Yeah. I bet you some people around there at that time thought, well, this is it. This has got to be that. World War II, the entire world is on fire. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, th that kind of stuff can get people really jacked up. And I've never found much pleasure in getting people jacked up around stuff that I, I can't be knowledgeable about. Yeah. I can't be specific. About. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, it's just... It's also just anxiety provoking. Yeah. You're just constantly worried. You're constantly preparing for something. I mean, now I guess, you know, if somebody came out and said, hey, prep by buying more toilet paper, it's a solid argument. <laughs> We've experienced some things in the in the most recent years that right. that demonstrate maybe some toilet paper might be good to have on hand. But but beyond that, but yeah, I guess we've strayed from our original topic. Yeah, look at this. But but I guess like you get I guess a point that I would make is that the exclusivity, like, I think the narrative argument that we kind of both made is is a really important one because it's like you you have to have some key you have to have some characters to accomplish any kind yeah. of story, yeah. and you have and if you're trying to, I mean, like Christ had it had to be one person it could only be one person it couldn't be all kinds of people and um and so and also if the exclusivity bothers you, well then Christianity is going to be a tough thing to be a part of. Because it's rather exclusive. Yeah. I think, you know, in closing, the way, the way that works in my head is I think kids are awesome. I, I just, kids fascinate me. Um, how they think, how they see their world, things they say, their joy. I, I can honestly say I have a love for children. I just think they're beautiful creatures. But you know what? I have two of them that are my favorites. Yeah. They're my sons. And I invest in the lives of my two sons with the hopes that they'll be a blessing to everybody they encounter. And it doesn't mean that I don't love other kids. It just means that I have a focus love and a responsibility for and a loyalty to these two because of my relationship with them. And again, maybe that's really simplistic, but that's how I see this whole question of, you know, chosen people is God loves every human being of every race, of every age, of every lifestyle he loves them his heart goes out to them he finds them fascinating he assigns them eternal worth but in that he has he has his children and right now those children are those who've made a decision of faith in jesus christ yeah and that's kind of the ones that he's you know Paying the most attention to it. It's hard to say that because he's at work in so many different ways. But he's he's locked in on the the, the followers of Jesus Christ because he's wanting to do something through them. And that is all done in the context of a greater history of he made a promise to a guy, and he's still committed to seeing through those promises that he made to him. So. But it's not that he loves them more than, it's just that he has a particular, a particular or intentional thing that he's doing to raise them, if you will, in the illustration of my boys, to raise them 
to be a blessing to others. Mm. It's not that he loves them more than anybody else. Or that they're more deserving of his love. Oh, yeah, I definitely don't agree with that one. No. The first one I might have to think about more. But um, but he's all, we're definitely the only ones that he can have a relationship with. What does that mean? Well, he, you can only, I mean, like, God can't have a relationship with somebody who has not repented. It's the entire problem to begin with. Yeah, so he doesn't have an intimate, um, divine relationship with yeah. them. But he has his, a general love for but humanity. His heart breaks for them. Yeah. 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 Like a general love for all of humanity. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. For God so loved the world. Yeah. That's every human being that's ever existed. His love is completely genuine and sincere for every person, no matter how broken they are, no matter mm -hmm. how far mm -hmm. away they are from his design. His heart breaks for them. He doesn't have a relationship with yeah or they don't have a relationship with him that is mutually satisfying and exclusive yeah or beneficial well that that alone too like israel was the only people that he was going to work with that were going to do the things necessary to have we didn't get to put into this part of the like argument but israel was the only nation that actually did the things necessary in a in order to have a relationship with god through all of those different sacrifices that they had to make right. the other countries weren't doing that and so, um, yeah, that also is important, I think, to point out. But, well, very good. Hopefully this added some type of clarity to whom, whomever asked. <laughs> some kind of clarity. Some kind of clarity. At least some ways of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is kind of the goal of a lot of our podcasts. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've told our church family for 28 years, if the best I can do is just get you to think, that's about the best I can hope. Um, I can't make you do anything. I can't make you believe anything. Can't make you change. Um, but if I can give you something to think about, uh, then in my paradigm, the Holy Spirit takes it from there. Yeah. And what you do with it, what you choose to make of that information, that's between you and God and you'll answer for that and i'm i'm not responsible for what you choose to do yeah at least i don't i should carry the, the weight of your choices yeah well yeah it's fruitless right yeah just gonna destroy you but all right well very good well thank you sir yes sir thank you we'll uh see everybody next time We hope you enjoyed this presentation of Cibolo Creek Community Church. If you did, please consider supporting the ministry of our church. Your donations make a difference. To check out more resources or to share a gift, please visit us at CibeloCreek.com. Thanks for listening.